Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Coming Home Network Presents, where we have conversations about the kinds of questions that people wrestle with when they're exploring the Catholic Church and wondering whether or not they should become a part of it. I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network, and if you're someone who's dealing with issues like the ones we're going to be discussing today, and we're going to be discussing several under an umbrella of issues, uh, please come visit us at chnetwork.org, uh, especially if you're looking for support from other people who have been on journeys like you. Uh, and you want to talk to people who, who share your very weirdly specific experiences. Uh, and when I say weirdly specific, you'll know what I mean here in just a moment. Uh, check out our online community. It's uh, community.chnetwork.org. And, of course, all this stuff is free because of your generous support. If you want to help uh, to make this continue to be free, then by all means, go over to chnetwork.org slash compass. So... When I was brainstorming this series, this Coming Home Network Presents project, I knew that I wanted these two guys on, I knew that I wanted them on together, and I knew exactly what I wanted to talk about with them. My guests today are Keith Little, a former evangelical Protestant, aka the Cordial Catholic, you can find his stuff on Patheos and YouTube, uh, and Keith Nestor, a former Methodist minister who many of you know from Catholic Feedback, his other efforts on YouTube and beyond, we'll talk about some of those at the end. And the topic is 90s, early 2000s evangelical Christianity, specifically uh, our experience of 90s Christian youth groups, and uh, adjacent to that, the whole question of the Christian music scene that really animated that youth group scene and became this massive cultural phenomenon that burned hot and bright. It changed millions of lives. And it built up and eventually destroyed the faith of a whole lot of people. <laughs> so the question is, why did this catch on so fast? Why did it get so big? Why do so many people from that world not even consider themselves Christians anymore? Um, and why on earth, why on earth would anybody from that world, especially the three of us, come away from that experience and think, I need to become Catholic? Well, we'll see what we can get to in the course of the conversation. Keith and Keith, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> Very happy to be here, Matt. Yeah, I've been on you guys' shows. I don't even know how many times at this point. You've been on each other's, but uh, we've been talking for a while about about this. Uh, I encourage people to uh, check out your Journey Home episodes. You've both been on the Journey Home. Excellent uh, conversations there. So I, I want to hear a little bit more about how you became Catholic in the context of this issue. But before we do that, we need to set the stage here. So I'm going to start with you, Keith Little. What qualifies you to speak on this topic? <laughs> nothing, Matt. Absolutely nothing at all. Uh, I, I, on this topic, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I became evangelical Christian uh, at the beginning of high school. So for me, that the, the youth group what was, era is this by the way the if you can give us like well, a year I don't want to I don't want to date myself because you guys are going to be you a have lot, to for the purpose to look this, a lot older right than when, when I tell yeah. them so for for me it was the very end of of the 90s uh, and and the year 2000 quite literally I became evangelical Christian and so for me the the music of that era the youth groups of that era was was everything for me right that was that was part of the catalyst of becoming Christian to begin with from kind of a nominally Christian household into an actual practicing evangelical charismatic Pentecostal Christian uh, that was the, the time uh, the the era for me right and and that scene the youth group scene became then everything for me so important for me in my in my faith journey so I lived that in a very real way I mean from there uh, became Catholic. As, as we all did, but that for me, I don't know if that's a that's a qualification, but uh, that's where I am. <laughs> so you've got your uh, your mixtape that you're going to pop in the van for the youth group. Name three bands that are on that mixtape. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's tough. Okay, so music was big in our youth group. We had a lot of bands that were part of our youth group. People that had little bands on the side. The punk scene was pretty big in our youth group. So we're talking pretty hardcore stuff like Head Noise. Uh, the dingy oh, wow. one. Is that the one, one with the girl singer who had the mohawk? Yeah, she was really cool. Yeah, uh, that was. You know, Did you say one twenty one? One twenty one. Yeah. Oh, I have a funny story about those guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. When it's my turn. Yeah, it's not your turn yet. It's, you know, th those were that. Those were the the big bands. Those kind of bit more hardcore punk, and then then hardcore stuff too, right? Like Soseo, Figure Four. Uh, a lot of those kind of bands, right? That, that was our, that was our jam. And then, 
you know, there were there were some room for more pop punk type stuff like MXPX, right? Or even ska stuff, Five Iron Frenzy, Supertones, that, that kind of stuff. So, and it's funny as I, as I mentioned a lot of these bands, I'm already thinking ahead, Matt, to the number of guys in these bands who, who have who have left the faith altogether. So it's kind of interesting, just thinking even at this point, listing those bands and going, yeah, those guys, those guys, those guys. So that's, that's I don't know, that's interesting. Yeah, so you went a lot more into the underground, like cornerstone, like fourth stage. <laughs> it was generator stage to. stuff. Yeah, we found guy. You know, you're gonna say like Goaty Hook yeah. and Value Pack or something. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, there was room for that stuff too. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, so Keith Nestor, then I'll ask you Yo. the same question. Uh, what qualifies you to speak on this topic? Well, I was a youth pastor starting in '95, so I was a youth pastor from '95 up until like 2007, and I was also a musician. So I came out of doing music into being a youth pastor who loved music too. So like I just rolled right into it. So our youth group was very heavy into music. We had our own worship team that did our own original music, but we had the whole range and we went to, we were close to Cornerstone. So we went to Cornerstone every year. We were, we were filling station wagons and minivans of kids and going to all the shows and we were driving the buses to different concerts and stuff. So that was a huge part of our experience. We hosted bands at our, um, at our church. So we, we had, we had the whole deal going on, man. And we were all about uh, again, it. You, you being in an era as a youth pastor, uh, where a lot of people who had been in bands, maybe a decade before had kind of gotten out of being in bands. And what's interesting about that era of the late 90s, early 2000s, is there were a lot of these people, uh, and Cornerstone was loaded with them, who used to be in bands and now were pastors. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting thing to to look back on that some of these guys who were used to be front men for like, well, even today, I think some of the guys from the Supertones are like lead pastors in congregations and stuff. So, I mean, it, it is an interesting kind of because a lot of these people saw what they did as ministry, right? I mean, that was I, I'm I'm assuming that you wouldn't have probably brought them in to play for your youth group unless some of them thought that what they were doing is trying to share the gospel. Well, it's interesting. Now, before people don't know, Cornerstone is a ginormous um, Christian music festival. It's no longer in existence, but for I don't know, probably 15, 20 years, maybe it was the place where you had to be in Bushnell, Illinois, in the middle of nowhere, if you were a Christian music fan. 20,000 people sometimes, hundreds of bands everywhere. It was like, it was, it was incredible. So when we talk about Cornerstone, that in and of itself was a movement that we all, we all relate to. And, and like I said, I happened to live about at the time, maybe two hours away from there. So it was no big deal for us to go. And yeah, so as a youth pastor, I would, I would try to bring these bands in. And what was interesting to me was the different level of, of how they viewed ministry. Some of these Christian bands didn't want to be called Christian bands. They were like, we're not Christians or Christian. We're, we are Christians in a band, but don't call us a Christian band. And then other people were very upfront about their, their faith. And that was what they viewed. So <clears throat> what I experienced was you could have this spectrum of these bands that played to Christian kids. I think that's a better way of talking about it. They, they were, they existed in that universe but within that universe, there was a whole spectrum of where people thought of themselves in terms of whether were their ministry or whether or not they're just bands that play to Christian kids. You can perhaps see on the shelf behind me a uh, a sampling of the range that that can produce. So yeah. on on one side, I've got the album cover for uh, the Pedro the Lion uh, album, where he talks about you know this Christian polished you know, evangelical guy who has this massive fall of gr from grace in the world of politics. It's a very sort of seemingly cynical, but also sort of a lament of, you know, kind of consumer polished image driven Christianity. Yeah. And on the other side, I've got the Daniel son family who, uh, saying, um, essentially like kinder core, like Sunday school songs to like right. quirky, like odd indie rock themes. So you've got that, but I, I feel like I should probably also put my own cred out here and, and speak, as to why I'm qualified. So I grew up a Christian kid in the world where we weren't allowed to listen to secular music. And, you know, in some ways that 
open a door for me later to discover bands I never would have otherwise discovered in the Christian world. So uh, obviously started off as a kid in the Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith world. I graduated to Petra, you know, as a middle schooler and then, <laughs> you know, sort of white heart somewhere around maybe age 13 or 14. I discovered through some late night Christian music video shows and late night. There was a, a Christian radio station in Troy, Ohio, that from 7 p.m. to midnight on Fridays would just run all this Christian underground stuff. Um, but I also go to the back of the music section at the Logos Christian Bookstore or Family Bookstores or Zondervan and just see what was back there and discovered all kinds of things. Here I was, a Christian kid who was seeing stuff in my world that didn't seem to match up with what I was reading in the scriptures about what a Christian ought to be. And I was seeing, also in the secular world, me going to public school um, this world that I knew was selling me a whole bunch of lies about what was going to make me happy. And the only people I knew who were talking about the problems with both of those worlds, right, the polished Christian world and the secular world, were these bands, right? Um, yeah. They were singing, like, the Psalms and stuff. And they were singing about hypocrisy that they saw. They were hungering to, like, really be authentic people, authentic Christians. So that meant something to me. That meant a lot to me. Um, so I... Uh, went on and played in bands, toured in bands. Uh, I played with a whole bunch of bands that we've mentioned already and ones that nobody's ever heard of, right? Nobody would have ever heard of us. I was like on the D list, uh, but we played with everybody. I booked shows. I worked um, briefly booking stages for the Ichthus Music Festival. As a matter of fact, I actually brought some show and tell. Nice. This is, uh, this is from 99. 99. This is main stage at the Ichthus Music Festival. I don't know if you see that dude rocking. Look at all that oh, hair. Man, he that has guy, hair, man. so you might not, you might not recognize cool. him. <laughs> so that's 99. That's, ex that's shockingly long ago. Dude. But I also I also worked at the music section at Family Christian Store. Got my name tag to prove it. <laughs> and uh, I was the guy. Um, I did a lot of the music ordering. This is at the store in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, I was the guy that when a mom came in, and said, hi, um, my kid listens to this band called Slayer. Uh, do you think they'll like this Jeff Moore in the distance tape? I would say, You're like, no, no ma'am, they will <laughs> not. And then I would hand her a copy of Zayo's Save Yourself from Hell album. You know, or Liberate. Like or Inferno. TX and Ferris. Yes. <laughs> right. So, um, but this was a, this is, this may sound like obscure and weird, but as Keith Nestor just mentioned, uh, and, and, you know, Keith, you you've been to Cornerstone too. I I have as well. I mean, there were this was a massive movement within the youth groups of the mid '90s, uh, the early 2000s. There were a whole bunch of bands that kind of sort of transitioned from this sort of '90s alternative rock, like the Prayer Chain and the Poor Old Lou, in towards more of like this, um, you know, kind of uh, aggressive underground hardcore and punk scene, like you were mentioning. Uh, uh, Keith Little and with Tooth and Nail Records, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. These kids uh, were were starved for somebody that spoke their language and that played music that they wanted to listen to. So, um, that's the music part of it. But well, I, what I want to know from both of you is, and we'll start with you, Keith Little. What role did that world play in getting you fired up about your Christian faith? Oh, that world was huge, Matt. Like I mean, the, the thing, right, is that you, you want to see your worldview reflected in in the world. Right. And music is a huge part of that. Right. So if you're, if you're a Christian kid uh, in youth group and you, <laughs> you, you like music, right. You want to find music that reflects that Christian worldview. So that becomes for you this kind of oxygen, right? That, yeah, this band is singing about things that matter to me about Jesus and the world and these struggles and hypocrisy. You mentioned that before. Like you want to see that stuff reflected in, in, in the world. So you find these bands, you find a movement like Cornerstone. And you, you go over a year. Like that's something you count down to. That's kind of the pilgrimage you, you go on as an evangelical kid in youth group. And for us, I'm, I'm jealous for Keith Nestor. It's a couple hours away. It was 12 hours away for us. So it's a 12 hour, usually overnight car ride. There's usually a caravan of cars that would go with the, with the youth pastor and some adult leaders and then cars behind them. Uh, I think the first time I ever drove with my sister somewhere or let her, or, or drove in the car with her driving was when, me and uh, and her and her boyfriend at the time, now her husband, went down to Cornerstone, and she drove in the nighttime portion of of that twelve hour drive. I remember waking up, being freaked out, like who's who's driving? Oh, she's driving, and I'm still freaked out because it's middle of the night. And, you know, we're kids driving down to to Cornerstone, but 
you want to be you, you want to see your world reflected in in that and and that music scene that that youth group scene that that was that was so huge at that time because here were bands that were singing about things that you were dealing with and you 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 know at some level they can't be they're not perfect like they're they're role models they're they're examples and often like you said before i think too matt a lot of them, or maybe Keith mentioned this. A lot of them don't want to be in Christian bands. They're Christians. <laughs> they're Christians singing in a band, right? So they themselves didn't want to be role models or examples necessarily. But even knowing that, you put them on a, on a pedestal sometimes because they are they're singing about things you're dealing with. And so you you figure, oh, they're they're up there on the stage. They must have these things worked out, or are working these things out, or have some kind of moral credibility or street cred to talk about these issues. You realize as you as you grow up and as an adult that maybe they were just as confused as as we were as the kids in, in the audience. They were our age. Right? I mean, yeah. for crying out loud, yeah, right? Yeah, right. But it, uh, but but even with some of those, as you mentioned, like uh, there were some bands that we played with that I wasn't sure if they were Christian Christians in a band or if there were some Christians in the band. The rest weren't. Yeah. All I knew is that they weren't singing about the same kind of crass, horrible things that everybody else was. Like we played with Stretch Armstrong at a place called Rocket Town in Nashville which was a venue, skate park slash music venue, owned by Michael W. Smith. And <laughs> we, play, we played with Stretch Armstrong, and I wanted to, you wanted to talk to him, and you wanted to, like, you know, be cool with him, but, like, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't sure. Like, they're really extremely positive, hardcore guys, but I just, I don't, you, you don't know. It wasn't clear in some of those circles, like, who was a Christian and who wasn't. It was just clear that these guys, the welcome mat was out with them, and they weren't going to come in and sing something horrible from the stage like you might get at some other venue. Yeah, and, and you realize afterwards too, like the, these stories come out through through podcasts and other places and deconstruction stories. You realize in, in hindsight, some of these bands you thought were filled with guys who were praying every day and who were really this was a ministry for them. It 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 wasn't in some cases, right? It was a business for some of them, or or a, or a career, or a livelihood, or just having fun jamming. And maybe one guy in the band was Christian, right? Who kind of wrote the lyrics and, and did, you know, was the front guy. But you realize in hindsight, maybe it wasn't what we thought it was in some cases. And these guys who we were inviting in to our lives and our youth groups and we're seeing their, their, their stuff maybe weren't the best guys to be inviting in or, or hadn't really thought these things through. And then, of course, we'll talk about this later, probably but when their faith collapses, well, there's, then there's there's echoes, right, for those people who really built those guys up and and loved their stuff and were were bought into that culture, right? Yeah, in some cases, built them up kind of unfairly, right, uh, because they didn't put themselves on those kind of pedestals. But yeah. you know, Keith Nestor, I mean, I want to get your comments on that too. But also, I think it's important to to kind of reflect on this is firing up a lot of kids about their Christian faith, but the the, the question I think that's also important to this conversation, uh, you know, dovetailing off of that, is what kind of Christians was this world producing? Like, what were their, you know, kind right. of foundations in faith? Like, what were, what is a, a person who comes out of that world who considers themselves as a Christian? I mean, like, what, I mean, Keith, you were, you're forming these kids, right? You're a youth pastor. Yeah. Like, what are you, what kind of Christians are you seeing this produce? Well, I think it's, you know, like like anything, there's going to be a variety of different responses to that. But when you're a youth pastor and you're trying to connect with kids, you, you're you always fighting the battle of the culture thinking that Christianity and the youth group culture are just a bunch of dorks and nobody wants to be a part of that. <clears throat> so when you can, so there's a part of you that's always like trying to show the world, hey, we can be cool like you. And we have cool bands, we have cool logos, we have cool activities. You know, you don't have to, you know, the, the days of of the the goofy Christian rock bands don't have to like be the thing. You can have actual bands that that are really good. So some people are coming into this with they that you could be you could be Hari Krishna for all they care. They just are like cool music, we're in, whatever the pastor dude says at the end, we can deal with that. Yeah, I'll show up and and do your mission trip or do your this or do your that because you have a cool band. So in some ways, we were trying to use, even as youth pastors, trying to use the music to reach the kids. But when you talk about what did that do, I mean, I've seen a lot of those kids who, as soon as that wasn't what they were into anymore, it just was part of like their faith was just connected to that. And it just went away, just like their involvement in that music went away. Now, that's not to say that there weren't people who, who, who didn't come to know the faith 
genuinely through that scene. But we all have to be aware of the fact that whatever draws someone into the faith, that's going to have a huge impact on keeping them in the faith and their attachment to that. And I just, I saw a lot of people who, who fell away when their musical taste changed or when they weren't able to be hauled around in a station wagon or a minivan anymore to go to shows. It was kind of like, okay, we moved on from that. That's what, that's a cool thing we did when we were kids, but is it really a part of their faith now? And it was, it's been kind of crushing. I mean, we had a really big, exciting youth ministry, hundreds of kids coming every week to our church. And I can't tell you how many times I had my heart broken when I would run into kids later, years later, who were strong in the faith, or at least appeared to be, and were were core into our youth ministry that have no semblance of Christianity anymore. And they just sort of look back on that time as, oh, that's what I did when I was a teenager, because that's the place that was open and inviting to me. And the music was a part of that. But I don't know. I didn't work that way. Like for me, when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, early 90s, music was what really connected me to my faith, you know, and if it weren't for those bands in in that scene, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I would even have a strong faith because that's what kept me grounded in my Christian faith. Cause I didn't have a youth group culture. I just had these bands that taught me about the Lord and what was, what was different about those two cultures, I think was the, the bands that were coming out of the eighties, the late eighties there back then, it was all about ministry, you know, bands like at the time, in the beginning, bands like Striper, bands like Bloodgood, bands like Baron Cross, bands like White Cross, like the metal bands, you know, um, even bands like The Crucified. These were bands that were like, we are doing this for ministry. They weren't just a bunch of dudes that were in a band and happened to play at Christian shows. Um, but what I saw was this shift that took place like in the late 90s, early 2000s, where you started hearing less and less about Jesus in the Christian band music. And I think some of that was just a reaction because bands didn't want to be pigeonholed. But I, and I think that's fine, but, but I think we lost something important about that. When, when we, when we sort of made space for bands that didn't have anything to do with Jesus lyrically, or they were, I'm not a minister. I'm not in ministry. I, and I was, I'm, I was always like, like, okay, that's fine, but don't market yourself to my kids. Cause I had a different view. Cause I'm a, I was a musician. I was a fan and I was a youth pastor. So as a musician and a fan, I was okay with bands that didn't have to have every song be about Jesus, you know, like, okay, that's fine. But as a youth pastor, I remember getting very frustrated with these bands that would be marketed to my world of youth ministry and to my students. But then at the same time, they didn't want to have any accountability or any responsibility or any any type of standard they had to adhere to when it came to their their ministry. And I used to say, well, fine. If you don't want to be a Christian band, okay, don't play at Christian shows. Don't play at churches. Don't don't try to accept that, you know, just go be a secular band and we can we can have fun with that. That's fine. So to me, I was sort of like, you know, on both sides of that issue. But I remember just feeling like losing a lot of respect for those bands because on one hand, they wanted, they wanted the easy path to doing music full time, which was way easier in the Christian world than it was in the secular world. But they didn't want to have to do the things that Christian bands should be doing, which would be talking about Jesus or even living a Christian life. And that, that, was, that was frustrating to me. Well, which I, I have think, some your question. Let me just say this real quick. Are you going to answer my question or not, Nestor? I mean, come well, on. This goes to your question. This is kind of the setup for that question. If those kids in the youth group culture are seeing bands that are saying, well, we don't want to talk about Jesus. We don't want to live a Christian life. We want to smoke cigarettes and say the F word and, and wear curse words on our T-shirts and, and do be all rebellious and whatever. Then what do you think those Christian kids are going to do? Those kids that I'm trying to bring to Christ who who they're looking up to these bands and the bands themselves are saying, Hey, that's not who we are. Well, what do you think that's going to produce? It's going to produce kids that don't want to be that either. Yeah. 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 And it, it, it did in a lot of ways. Did you have something that you wanted I, to add? I just wanted to, I mean, riff on that for a second because I, so I listened to MXPX before I became Christian. I remember becoming Christian and, and putting on one of their albums and I, I heard them mention God, you know, my career sings song. I thought, 
oh, is this it? Is this guy's Christian? And I, and, you know, I pulled out the lyric book out of the CD and we're going through the lyrics. I'm like, oh yeah, there's, there's references that I hadn't noticed before, before I became Christian to, to God in a couple of these, in a couple of these songs. So I thought, well, they must be a Christian band. And I did a little bit of research on them, but it, very early internet days, probably even before the internet and realized they were being sold in the Christian bookstore. And, but like you say, Keith Nestor, a few of their songs kind of mention God and the rest kind of don't. And so that, that for me being a new Christian, being a teenager, kind of set it up as, okay, well, this is okay. This is kind of how I, I'm okay living this way, right? I, I'm okay having different relationships with, with, with girls and going out to parties and stuff, but, and occasionally kind of thinking about God in these contexts, right? Because they weren't a Christian band. They were kind of Christians in a band and I guess maybe nominally so at that time even. And they also and, like hit the music industry with full force when they were like young teens. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we're so, dealing with I mean, a lot they of grew these, up in public. Yeah, yeah. They, they did. They did. Right. And for me, that was kind of like, like you said, Keith, this is going to be how you think of Christianity. Okay. I can live my faith out like this because mm-hmm. here's an example of how it's being lived out. But really that example wasn't, wasn't great. Right. They were kind of more, just more guys who were nominally Christian in a band, but you see that and you kind of think, well, that's how, how Christians live, right? When you're young and a new Christian and in, in youth group, right? But, but really we emulate that. We end up not being Christian very long, right? You, you hit difficult things that all of us did. And you don't have the, the equipment. You don't have the, the ability to wrestle with those issues of faith when your faith is this kind of pop punk faith that you've inherited through th- this music, right? Yeah. So I have, I have a few different things I want to say in connection with that. First, I want, I want to come to the defense of my friends who played in these bands and took advantage of pastors like you, Keith, uh, <laughs> for a couple of different reasons. Uh, and then I want to get a little bit to the um, to sort of the theological foundations and why this fell apart for so many people um, in a number of ways. So, you know, I grew up in a very strong Christian home, went to strong Christian churches, went to Bible college, worked in a Christian bookstore. But I also saw... Um, this sort of phenomenon that would happen. And I was in central Kentucky and actually you probably, you guys both grew up in semi flyover country situations as well. Right. This is where it was really big. It was really big for these like youth groups that were, you know, not centered in urban areas. This is like the chance to be cool in the middle of a cornfield. Right. Like you, cause you got your tapes in the mail through like, you know, CBD or whatever it is that came, you know, whatever it is. As Christian book distributors, I should point out CBD, I think means something different now. But um, <laughs> the issue that we were running into is we could play these Christian coffee houses and we were Christians. We didn't make any secret about it. We'd say something between songs, but somebody would hit us after the show and say, man, I'm really disappointed that, you know, um, you guys build yourself as a Christian band and I brought you in and like you guys didn't give an invitation at the end of the show. And we're like, well, mm-hmm. you're the pastor, man. I th- we just thought we were coming to have like a fun social night of good, clean fun and mention, you know, our faith in between songs a couple of times. And then at the same time, what's happening is the rise, because we were more like a, I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, more like a Foo Fighters Z, like Jimmy World kind of band in that era. And in that same sort of space within Christianity, the praise and worship movement is like skyrocketing, exploding, and selling bajillions more CDs than any of the bands we just mentioned, all of them perhaps put together. And so there was also this pressure for us to play praise and worship songs as part of our set. And we we're like, well, that's not what we do. We're not a, I'm not a worship leader. I also was wrestling with what, what is worship, a question that would eventually lead me to the Catholic Church, by the way. Um, but in it, there's also this question, too, of like, it was almost like a reaction against this utilitarian, you know, kind of use of music. Like, what is it that a Christian should think about when they go to make art? Um, and... I can guarantee you that that was not what every single person who was making music that didn't necessarily mention God was thinking. But I know several bands for whom that was, uh, right? It was like, well, what if I just make, what if I just play this song to the glory of God and write the most authentic and you know, good things that I can write as a way of showing my talents? Now, that's very different than, you know, smoking cigarettes and saying the F word in the church parking lot. I feel like that's a different kind of category of thing. But um, it was kind of an interesting reflection with me so you know for instance i would listen to some of these bands and they have like references not to god but you'd see like some like 
Like you'd be listening to a Thrice album and they make some reference to a C.S. Lewis book or something. And it doesn't, it's not overtly Christian, but it causes you to go pick up a book that you might not have otherwise read. And Daniel Amos did this kind of thing all the time. And there were some other bands like this that would, you know, kind of work it in. Uh, I think Precious Death even had like a reading list inside of one of their albums in the early 90s. But yeah, I mean, it, it is an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon because you there was no one way that this was done, right? There was no one way that this was being approached. But but the thing that I do want to get to here is the theological foundations of it, because in some ways, a lot of the people who are running to these bands, um, they're not getting the theological foundation for their bands, so they're getting it from somewhere else, likely from the church where they go to youth group or likely from the family who said, you can't listen to secular music, so you have to listen to this, which means that these are a lot of solo scriptura Protestants. Um, essentially a lot of faith alone Protestants. So I'm wondering if, um, well, I'll start with you, Keith Nestor. Like, how does being a faith alone sola scriptura Protestant who is also pushing the envelope in all these edgy questions and ideas, once those things come to a head, I mean, what does that do to somebody's faith? Well, I think that goes to the point of when you don't have hard boundaries around what it, what we're trying to do here, it's really hard to hit that mark. So you have some, you know, just like everything without, without a, a set standard of theology or of, of um, a, even a goal. Yeah, make no mistake. There was no magisterium running the no, scene. No. At so all. it was really at up all. to everybody. So like, you know, I would have groups come in and sometimes they would say, Hey, we're just here to play. We just want to entertain your kids. You know, we're not going to preach. We're not going to do whatever. And I'd be like, no problem. I can handle that. You know, other times you'd have guys that come in and they're just like, okay, we're going to pray with kids after the show and we're going to try to lead them to Christ. And it's very, you know, but depending on where they go into what church, you don't know what you're going to get. So I can, I can, I can sympathize with, with the bands who are just like, we're just trying to play. We just want to do our thing. And I can understand what it's like to never be able to make everybody happy, but they don't even necessarily have a theological framework they're working with. They're just playing different churches. So you, one night you could be playing at a Pentecostal charismatic church. The next night you could be playing at a Baptist church. The next night you could be playing at a mainline, uh, you know, Methodist church. You could, so how can they work within a theological framework? I, what I find to be the, what I found to be the case was nobody really cared. It was, it was, Hey, these lyrics, that guy in the band writes them, whatever. We don't care. We just want to play. And whoever was writing the lyrics, they were sort of the boss on those things. And you, you, it was a hodgepodge. You could get anything. So I, I feel like that in and of itself, you know, we have to really step back and go, what was the purpose behind all this? What was the purpose? Is it, is it just to entertain Christian kids? And if so, that's fine. Or is it to reach the lost? That's a different issue, isn't it? You know, and, or is it, we just like playing music and we just like having fun. And a couple of the guys in the band, you know, like Jesus. So sometimes we'll say some stuff. So the whole thing was without form or structure. So therefore it's going to have very loose effectiveness because we don't even know what we're trying to do. So theologically, pff, who knows? Yeah, and that was, that was my experience as well. But again, you would find people who are absolutely sold out 1,000% on fire for Christ and may not have said a word about it from the stage, but would be praying with kids after shows, right? It was, it was, a, it was a complete and total range, but um, yeah. But this is, where, this is where I think, Keith Little, you will have some very interesting things to say. Um, because a lot of people in that, you mentioned a lot of bands uh, from that world, uh, members of them or the entire band's completely have deconstructed. I think in the mainstream, one of the bigger ones that people knew about was uh, Derek Webb from Cademan's Call, who was a hardcore Calvinist and then, you know, kind of deconstructed into some sort of agnostic. But also some of the members of Five Iron Frenzy, um, the lead singer Grandma Train, Pete Stewart, uh, a bunch of the Tooth and Nail uh, roster uh, were varying degrees. This, uh, but, it, but not all of them, because the guys from the band Luxury, I think like Half of them are Orthodox priests now. Like, it, there's a complete range. But I know you, um, you've talked even to like uh, the guy from Hawk Nelson who had kind of like a deconstructing experience, uh, having played in like a fairly popular Christian pop punk. And one of the one, one of the ones that would be more seen as as like a positive 
kind of more overtly Christian than some of the other Christian punk bands out there. I mean, in in, in talking to him and in, in reflecting on your own experience, I mean, this deconstructionism that comes out of this and, and is manifested in the lives of so many people who are part of this, like what kinds of questions were, were leading to the deconstruction of, with your friends and, you know, when you were you know, interviewing the guy from Hawk Nelson and, and other kinds of conversations like that. Yeah, yeah. That's John Steingart from Hawk Nelson. Yeah. And I had to admit to him that I didn't actually like Really him. cool guy, by the way. Yeah. Everybody needs to go listen to your podcast with him. I thought it was, was fantastic. Really cool. Like he was he was very open and honest and such a, such a humble guy. We had a great conversation, but I had to admit to him that I didn't, didn't actually like his music at all, but <laughs> which was awkward. I heard that. We, That's because you're way too hardcore yeah, underground. Too, you know what? They they actually played it at our, at our church youth group. We had like, you're not talking about the purpose and point of these things, uh, Keith. And we had this New Year's Eve concert night at our youth group open to the public, trying to get kids in the high schools to come in and check out these mus- these different bands. I was there because my friend's band was opening and they were a pretty, they were a pretty legit band. Uh, opening for Hawk Nelson, who played after them. I think we left during Hawk Nelson's set, but I had to admit to John that I didn't really like his music <laughs> during youth group. But that was, you know, what it was. But his experience that he talked to me about on the show, that I think it makes a lot of sense. I've heard this other places too, is that, and you may have experienced this too, Matt, being in a band touring, you know, a Christian band. But one of the things that he said was it was struggle for him was going to all these different churches, right? Like a Methodist church, a, a Pentecostal church, a Charismatic church, like an Anglican church, on different nights and playing at these churches and realizing that all their theologies are slightly different. And so he told me, like, you no, know, they they didn't really have a, a Sunday church because they were on tour, so they'd go to a, di- a different church they might have been playing that day and go to worship service at that church and realize how different it was from the church they were at the week before. And so the, the exposure to all these different kinds of, of churches really kind of shook his foundation for, well, what what's Christianity mean, right? You mentioned Derek Webb, too, right? Some of these guys who... And I, the list goes on, right? David Bazan from Page of the Lion. You mentioned Five Iron Frenzy. Uh, all these bands that, you know, they were, they were singing about pretty, pretty deep theological topics in many cases, right? I mean, Cadman's Call, they are pretty deep theologically in a lot of these things they, sa- they sang about and really struck a chord for a guy in, in university going through these same kind of struggles. Like they were a band that I would put on and resonate with these different kind of struggles I was going through as, as a Christian trying to live in a, in a secular world. But you realize that maybe they didn't really have their theology all the way figured out, right? Or you know, my friend Doug Beaumont, who wrote Evangelical Exodus, it's a fantastic book about evangelicals leaving kind of uh, for Catholicism, leaving that after doing some really deep thinking. Uh, one thing that he's, he mentioned before that I've always kind of gone back to is the idea that the, the worldview that a lot of us and a lot of these musicians we're deconstructing, we're leaving, was a very small, narrow worldview. It was those evangelical churches they toured, maybe, right? Or that evangelical Christianity that they they sang about, that they learned through their church and maybe a bit of Bible college or something. You deconstruct fr- from that, right? And for the three of us, I think, we we all deconstructed in a sense, right? But we, we found a, a larger Christian worldview, the Catholic Church, this huge, ancient you know, giant thing, we found that versus just leaving this narrow band of Christianity. So we all we all left this narrow Christianity that we knew from our experiences, like these like guys in bands did, but instead of just leaving that and thinking that was all that the Christian world was, I think the three of us found something, you know, and those guys in luxury <laughs> who are now Orthodox priests, you find you you find something that's bigger than the worldview that you had, and you realize that that worldview was very, very small and narrow, right? Derek Webb was singing about very, very deep Calvinist ideas, but that was Calvinism. That's a very small Christian worldview. You reject that. You aren't rejecting all of Christianity. You're rejecting a narrow part of Christianity. But those of us who, you know, who listened to them, who, who, you know, were formed hearing that kind of music, right? You see a guy leave Christianity like that and you go, oh, well, Maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe he's onto something. Maybe he's smarter than I am. I, I should investigate this. And too often that investigation is just rejecting that small, narrow worldview you had. That's really a small slice of Christianity versus realizing how much bigger that picture actually can be versus your tiny little church that you, you went to and, and things you believed in, right? Well, 
a, a perfect example of that. And and gosh, Keith is a, as a youth pastor, I'm sure that this is something that was like really close to your heart. Is I mean, we see. I don't want to go too far down this road because I feel like it will derail the entire conversation. But I mean, how many people have deconstructed over the question of purity culture, uh, right? Mm, and yeah. uh, and the way that purity culture really reigned in that same scene, right? Which often uh, demonized women for being women <laughs> in a lot of ways or uh, viewed human sexuality and the relationship between a man and woman in terms of like what you're not allowed to do. So there was nothing like a theology of the body in that world, just the same wow. as there was nothing like a magisterium to help us understand yeah. how scripture should possibly be interpreted. Also, there was kind of in some senses a disdain for history built into the movement, right? Uh, because we were frustrated at the way that our parents and their generation had been hypocritical Christians, right? Because of all the scandals and televangelism in the 80s or whatever have, have, happened to have happened. So like there's, there's the theological framework... Um, that you're operating with is, well, I mean, as, as you put it, Keith Little, I mean, it's a very small kind of form of Christianity. It's one that sprung up in America and sprung up very recently. Yeah, I, I think that, that you know, you mentioned the purity culture thing, and I, I think about when I started noticing people deconstructing, a lot of it had to do with those social issues that were, that were like, they were, you know, I don't remember there being this like, liberal conservative divide back in the day that exists now, probably because there wasn't social media as much back then. We know that was back in the days of MySpace. And it seems like now, like as soon as people could start to categorize each other, according to how you felt about these social issues, what you think about homosexuality, what you think about, um, you know, women in leadership or this or that or whatever, then people started to attach their Christianity to those issues. And nobody wanted to, go there. So it was like, okay, well, uh, I talked to, you know, and I've heard other people who said, well, yeah, I was a Christian, but then, you know, um, this, you know, this guy in the church told me that, that, that it was wrong to, that it was a sin to be gay. So, you know, I can't be a Christian anymore. And this guy in that band, well, he's gay. So I guess he can't be a Christian anymore. And, and so people started to sort of react to some of those social issues and with the purity culture, I mean, that was a, that was a thing too, where people really struggle with that because they were human. And it was almost like you had to live this, this really narrow version of morality related to one issue only. And that's the only thing that seemed to matter, you know? And if people struggled with that, there, there wasn't room for them really in, in that scene anymore. So that a lot of them just said, well, forget it then we're just, we're just jumping ship. Yeah, well, but it also happened too with, you know, I mean, again, this is this is a solo scriptural world as well. Uh, you know, you find one thing that challenges some passage in the Bible that you always took literally that has also never been li literally taken by the Catholic Church over time, but maybe was taken literally by your fundamentalist world, and you get something that challenges it, and then the whole thing falls apart. It's a house yeah. of cards because you've never had another way of thinking about the Bible other than sola scriptura. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a whole bunch in that, but I'm seeing how far we've gotten in my questions and seeing how much time we've taken. So I want to get to the, to this other question because yeah. instead of just doing the dissecting and sharing all the, all the, you know, the heartbreak that we experienced from all the fun times that we had, right. I feel like I should write an album based on all these conversations. <laughs> I want to know how being part of this world prepared each of you, like uniquely prepared you to accept um, the claims of Catholicism once you really authentically encounter them. Um, yeah. Does anybody want to go first? It helped me a lot because when I, when I was surveying the landscape and seeing all of the confusion and circus and chaos of not having anyone who got to call the shots in terms of Christianity and looking at different people and, and walking through these issues going, well, how do we really know? And who gets to say? And who, where's that authority? And seeing different things and interacting with different people in that world, that, of course, you know, for me, that issue of authority and who gets to decide what Christianity even is, that's that helped lead me to Catholicism because I wanted something that was going to be, was going to require my all in. I, seen so, I had seen so many wishy-washy Christians and so many people that just kind of made it up as they went along. 
And when you're presented with Catholicism, I mean, I think Catholicism is like the most punk rock thing to be as a Christian because it's, you know, it it is the complete rebellion against your own free will and against the world and against society. And and it is also very deep. And it's it's totally hardcore, in my opinion. That in some ways, I was ready for that because of the the background I'd had in in in, in this scene. <laughs> That's good. It reminds me of that Chesterton quote, right? That the Catholic Church is the one thing that can help you not be a slave to yourself, right? Into the world. Right. That's, that is, that's a punk rock idea, yeah. right? To, to can totally, and that's a Christian idea, like dying to yourself, right? And, and, and letting something else, you know, take the reins. That's Jesus through the Catholic Church, right? Not trying to, yeah, I think, Matt, going to your, to your question, I mean, again, it's idea, like, like Keith said, you see all these different churches, these different bands that kind of believe slightly different things. And you realize that this isn't sustainable. This is, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? There's got to be some kind of magisterium, like the magisterium of, of Christian punk rock right? that didn't exist that we, that we were looking for, right? Why are these bands, you know, beliefs slightly different? Why are these guys like John Steingart who are touring different churches, seeing different beliefs mm. and kind of going, well, well, something's got to give. I had a guy on my show recently who's part of this big family band, the Annie Moses band. And they were, they were a, a, a evangelical Christian band. The whole band became Catholic because they were touring different churches, right? Playing worship songs, playing these sets for churches. And they, they, they kind of went as a group, as this big family. <laughs> all of them kind of worked out the idea that, well, this makes no sense that all these churches believe different things. How can we all call ourselves Christian? You know, what's the limit? What's, what, what's the umbrella? How does this work when one church says, Yes, baptism is okay for babies and they're saved. And one church says, no, you must be, you know, you must be the age of accountability and agree and understand what you're doing and then baptize and then you're saved. One says it's symbolic. One says it's, it's an actual thing that's doing something. How can we all call ourselves Christians in the same kind of, you know, you know, uh, umbrella? Right. I think those are the kind of questions that you wrestle with and you, and whether it's through, you know, listening to different bands, watching them go through that or, being a band yourself and having that experience of all these different varieties of Christianity, you realize there's got to be some kind of thing that holds that together, some way of knowing if you're in or you're out, right? Which we as Catholics know now as the magisterium. It 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 makes a lot of sense, and it's I think it's pretty punk rock. Well, and it's also shockingly freeing and liberating. And yes, you know it's interesting too. Uh, you know, I would say everything that you guys both just said. You know, when I would go back and listen to my lyrics from. You know, I was writing back in my late teens, early 20s. It's a mishmash of a hundred different theologies because I wasn't even aware at the time that I was listening to a Calvary Chapel band mixed with like a hardcore reformed band mixed with like, you know, I mean, these lyrics are all kind of just like seeping into you, like even like little anti-Catholic things that would flow in through you. Like, uh, you know, I don't think I was a studied anti-Catholic ever, but, you know, you listen to a song uh, the Crucified did a song that was covered by The Blamed later um, called uh, A Guy in a Funny Suit and the Pope. And a Pope, and yep. it's just like it's on their first album. Yep. Well, their second Yeah, album. it's just like ripping all oh, these like, people who are... The Crucified... The Crucified the came over the first, then The Blamed did it. Okay. Then The Blamed yeah. covered it. I used to trail. sing that's I, I, The Crucified was oh, probably yeah. one of my favorite bands. People you know? bow down and they're kissing your rings. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah it's... Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know but what you're saying. it just gets into you, but... But you don't realize you're having like all these different theologies. And once you start to realize it, you're like, okay, well, which one, which one? But I think the other thing too, for me, and maybe the two of you can reflect on this is that I also thought at the time that it was, well, well, first of all, I'll just say that, you know, I, and I've said this in other spaces that what makes a band Christian was a big question that led to what makes art glorifying to God, which leads to a bigger yeah. question is what's the relationship between truth and beauty and goodness? And there's only one place that's got a great answer for that that works, and that is the Catholic Church. So that was kind of the trajectory for me. But also there was this sense that when we were in this, it was like it was the whole world to us. And only mm-hmm. once you get a little bit removed from it do you realize it's this one little yeah, thing happening yes, in this yeah. one little spot in this one small era. Because even the glory days of Tooth and Nail Records only lasted about a decade or two in the whole life of Christianity and really mostly in the United States of America. I mean, Cornerstone was massive. It was huge. Um, it was epic and awesome. And I wish it were still around, but it was a moment in time. And the church, as we know it now being plugged into the sacraments and the apostolic tradition and 
being connected with our brothers and sisters around the world and across time and every tongue and tribe and nation, it's just so much bigger. And it just, I, it means something to me to be part of a universal church and not just a band that thinks that we have it right because like we read the right books or like listen to the right stuff. I don't know. Very true. Yeah. And you realize how small that world is, right? Like you say, you realize how small that is, that, that your experience of Christianity is really tiny. And to plug into the 2000 year old Catholic church, right? That is a much, you know, you're, you're swimming in a small little pond, a tiny little pond, like a, like, you know, a, a raindrop, <laughs> a raindrop. And suddenly you realize, oh my gosh, this is way bigger than this. And I don't, I don't have to reject swimming in this raindrop because this way bigger pool that I, that I can, the ocean that I can swim in that's been here for 2000 years has answers to those questions that maybe caused me to begin to deconstruct in the first place, right? That band sing, you know, I, I famously David Bazan from Pit of the Lion, right? Rejected Christianity based on his understanding of, of a predestination and some issues of how, how you're saved and, and the fall. Well, and a lot and, of hypocrisy right? that he saw that, that made yeah. us all mad. Yeah. That made us all mad. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, I wished I could sit down with someone like that and say, you know what? Look, what you rejected is this tiny slice of the world you were living in as a touring Christian musician. There's way more to the Christianity than, than this, and there are answers. You might not like the answers, but there are answers in the in the Catholic Church to all these questions that you have that are really, really robust answers, right? Not this like 10 second apologist thing you'd find in a little paperback book that some evangelical guy has written or something, right? Not, not answers in the purity culture or something like that, right? There are like, right, right. If you compare theology of the body to like, you know, to, to purity culture in, in youth groups, right? In the nineties and two thousands, theology, theology of the body is this huge, substantial, you know, understanding of the, the whole person of, of the person scheme of salvation and creation and sexuality, right? That's a good, good, I think it's a good comparison because those two things are so hilariously balanced, right? A tiny little kind of theology versus this huge, massive thing. I think it's the same for Catholicism, right? Versus that small slice of evangelical Christianity that we kind of in, inherited and, and, and lived in before becoming Catholic, right? There's, you can't compare. There's a, a much bigger thing out there <laughs> called Catholicism. Yeah. yeah, Nestor, you had something that you wanted to add. Well, I just, you know, I was thinking about what you were talking about. I listened to your to um, your conversation with Steingard, Keith, and I remember thinking this guy should be Catholic because everything yeah. that he was was dealing with with it sounded to me like, and it's an issue that we all dealt with was how do I really know? Like, why is this version of Christianity that I believe in the right one when so many other people have different versions and Nobody can. So when you get, when you come to that place, you either, you go one of two ways. You either throw your hands up and say, like, like I think John did say, well, then none of them can be true or it's impossible to know. Or you really say, I need to find out which one makes the most sense and has the best, has the best, um, you know, story to tell when it comes to Christianity. And a lot of, a lot of these guys just say, well, when I when I realized that little slice of where I was has no more validity than any one of these other slices, I guess I just throw the whole thing away. I think for those of us that become Catholic, we were there. We were at that fork in the road at one yeah. point in time in our lives where we said, "Okay, I I can't keep doing what I'm doing right now." And it's interesting because I, you know I've been Catholic for almost five years now, and I think to myself sometimes like, "Okay." If, if I couldn't be Catholic anymore, what would I be? And I feel like at this point in my life, after having seen what I've seen and been where I've been and done what I've done, I feel like I, I don't think I could ever go back to that place of being convinced that one of those little slices was the truth. I think I would have to just chuck the whole thing because the Catholic worldview makes, you know, or you could argue the Orthodox worldview too, if you really wanted to go there, you know, any of those faiths that are tied back to the apostles, you'd have to say that it has to be that way or nothing. And because otherwise Jesus doesn't make any sense. But most of these guys grew up in a culture where there wasn't that sense of, of truth that way. It was, you just make it up as you go along. But you grow up at some point in time and you go, okay, is that really how God set this thing up? 
And I think a lot of this deconstructionist culture has come from a person who's saying, I reject something about that piece of the pie I've been living in based on just how I feel. But they're, but because they, they're, it's exposed that there's no objective reason for it to be true. And they miss what God has given to us in the Catholic faith. And I think that's, that's a shame. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that other than to, to just invite people in that situation to say, let's have a conversation about Catholicism. And I think you were, you were going there with him, Keith, but you know, and who knows, maybe there's a way back for guys like these deconstruction guys who deconstruct, cause we all have to a certain yeah, degree, like yeah. you said, it's just where do there we know maybe up? to it, Nestor, there yeah. ain't no, maybe where to we, it. There where is, do we want there up? is. Uh, but, but I'm a, I'm a thousand percent in your corner uh, yeah. on what you just said a moment ago. I uh, I spent a fair amount of time in that headspace uh, that a lot of these deconstructed guys who are evangelical and nothing now, right? I spent a yeah. lot of time. I mean, it's a it's a it's a dark road. In many ways, deconstructionism is a damning mirror to sola scriptura and says, look what happens. Look what happens by saying there's a universal right of private judgment to interpret scripture. You've just said that it can mean anything and therefore it, it means nothing. That's what that you've opened the door for that. But, yeah. or you can say, maybe there's a different way to come about this. And uh, that's yeah. where we all landed in the Catholic church. And I am a hundred percent in your corner, a thousand, a million percent in your corner that when I am in that moment of doubt that it hits me about once every couple weeks, it is not, should I be Catholic or should I be something else? It's, Either the Catholic Church is the one true church founded by Jesus Christ and still exists on this planet today, or it's all horse manure and God doesn't even exist. Those are the two options as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing I would just want to say, because I don't want to count out the fact that some of these guys that we've even mentioned by name might be mo be watching this, right? Or some people who maybe played in this scene uh, or who yeah. know any of the three of us. Right from going to shows with us, or maybe they even played at your church, Keith Nestor. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. Or maybe we ran into them and hung out at Cornerstone. If you're watching this, first of all, we love you guys, uh, or we wouldn't be spending this much time talking about this subject. It's just such a deeply formative time, and I have such amazing memories of uh, of being a oh, part man, of that. And it has made me it's made me the kind of person I am today. But closing question is this. Um. I don't, I'm not going to make you pick the most amazing concert you ever went to mm. during that era, but I'm going to ask you, okay. what is one of the most epic, memorable, favorite <laughs> shows that you remember from that era? Uh, wow. Any takers? <laughs> well, I can tell you, um, they weren't, they probably were, they were never like one of my favorite bands. But I saw P.O.D. at Cornerstone the night they announced that they had just been signed to Atlantic Records. and I was in that part, tent. Yeah, I was in that tent. And that was like, that was You're like- You're kidding me. You were in that show? Oh, I was there. I was there. They were and, touring and, with Blindside. Yeah, I, I, I had seen, I had seen they, they play with Blindside and Project 86 at an old, what used to be a Denny's in Chicago. I drove a, I drove a, a, a old school bus that was green with a bunch of youth group kids to that. We broke down the way home. We had to drive all the way back to Iowa in third gear, which meant I could go about 25 miles an hour. It was, it was a crazy scene. Um, I had to throw in youth group kids out the door to run up and pay the tolls, run through the toll booth because I couldn't stop, put them back. I mean, anyway, but that show at Cornerstone that year was, was insane because it, to me, it felt like, it felt like a worship service, like, the, it felt like what I was looking for with why I got into, to, to, to music in the first place. So that, that, that show was incredible. Also, I don't know if it was that year or the year before, but we saw Zayo in the tent at, at Cornerstone back when they didn't have a bass player and, and Brent Detter from Juliana Theory was playing guitar and that was sick. Living Sacrifice, you know, I mean, all these bands, like it, Whatever band so it that was, POD was show, I would tell you that. Yeah, man. that that POD show, if I recall, that was the year the MC Hammer played main stage. Yeah, that was uh, a disaster. <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, his bus got stuck in the mud. It took forever to no, get down there. It was also the year that was the end of dork. It, it was bad. It was bad. Yeah, but it was also the year that Plank Eye had broken up like three weeks before, but reformed and played like a show on the stage. And Eric played that song "Goodbye" off that album. And it was just like everybody was just like, oh bawling. my gosh, everybody was bawling. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that song but. Uh, but if you if you and I were both in that same tent, whatever year that was, it would have been yeah, like ninety nine or something. Yeah, um, yeah, I was there. There were more people up on the stage behind Pod watching them than there were probably out in the crowd. 
it was incredible. It was crazy. It was crazy. Um, it was crazy. Yeah. So those would be, and then this is kind of a random thing, but I saw Vengeance Rising play in a oh my gosh. club basement when I was a senior in high school before obviously they deconstructed or Roger deconstructed. And yeah, that yeah. was crazy, you know. Um, yeah, Vengeance Rising and uh, Jimmy from Deliverance both deconstructed. Like those guys. Jimmy were... did too. Jimmy. J- oh, Jimmy Brown. He, he's sort of like yeah. weird cabal Judaism now, sort of. Yeah. Oh, is he bad? Well, that's you know, that's a step in the right direction. Well, I, yeah, I don't know that he would say he fully deconstructed, but I've read some stuff from him because um, Deliverance was one of my favorite bands. If anybody's um, wondering if we really are, we're actually into this scene at this point. Like, there's no question. Oh, there. yeah. No I mean, yeah. There, this is like a. This is like if if HM Magazine were to have a podcast at this point. So. Oh, I could, I could, yeah, I, I was, I was all in on that, you know. But um, yeah. Right, man. Well, then, then Keith Little, um, a, right. a memorable concert. It's gonna be cornerstone for the Carmen. for the first answer. <laughs> so I can think. I was, I was there a couple years after you guys. I think it was 2002 or maybe 2001, maybe. Uh, I was probably there too. And it was the year that Pedro the Lion, uh, David Bazan brought an opening act with him just like some guy who just wasn't on the bill just brought brought him with him and and played for like half his lot of time and then he came on and went well i'm playing until they turn off the the pa system And this was like you know midnight like he was the last guy in that tent we thought oh this is so cool he's like sticking to the man he's gonna just keep playing all his songs and but you could it was an amazing concert because it was just song after song it was just you know he was a song machine cranking them all out and it was really fun fun to watch you got a sense at the time, though, that he was beginning to wrestle with things because even then he was a little bit like, you know, this this, this scene isn't my thing anymore. And this was Cornerstone, which was, was supposed to be the scene. And the other show was this band called, I think it was either Figure Four or Comeback Kid. They have similar They were interchangeable lineups. members on those yeah. two bands. Yeah. Somehow, a bunch of my, my friends in this little tiny town, like literally in the middle of a cornfield, this like veterans hall or something they managed to book you know comeback kid to come and play and we're talking a room that's maybe like i don't know maybe a thousand square feet a really small room with the stage and the band and just packed in with kids mm. to hear them play and you couldn't tell who was in the band and who was part of the audience because it was all just so packed in so tight and it was a this amazing show just an outrageous show and the band there's no for them to go so they're all just there all night you know we all just kind of hanging out with with these guys and getting to know them and, and chatting and it was an amazing experience right that kind of that really solidified that uh you know that 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 cool guys could be christian and in a band and playing yeah. cool music and hanging out and that this was an experience of christianity i don't know now today where those guys are in in that band where their faith journeys have, have led them i know bazan is Famously deconstructed very publicly. I don't think he's. I don't know though. He's he's been in a lot of side projects with like Jason from Starflyer Fifty Nine yeah, so and stuff. Who Jason still? He's Christian. With you never. Maybe he's watching. I never lose hope for anybody. David, call David, me. David, if you're watching, we love you, man. <laughs> I still yeah. listen to this stuff like all the time. Oh yeah, it's all good stuff. It's good stuff. I'll, I'll give I'll give two quick reunion shows that I went to that were amazing. I went and saw. Um, I booked play myself a, a solo set in the art house at Tom Fest. Um in the pacific northwest just so i could go see a poor old lou reunion show uh mm. i drove up to go see the prayer chain play a reunion show in chicago i think they've actually got another one coming up soon actually they may be just playing the entire mercury album i'm not sure um but a, a favorite memory was a little bit after it was actually after i was married so it was a little bit kind of on my way out of the scene but we went and saw me without you at this club in louisville and if you've ever seen me without you I mean, they're like full on hippie. They're like out there cooking their food on the sidewalk using like little, you know, propane tanks. They found and the food like, in the dumpster, probably by dumpster the way. They probably dumpster dived yeah, they before did. the show they to did. get that food in the first place. Um, and then they get up and they play and there is no ventilation in this club. And there are like 500 people in there and it is just sweat pouring. And at one point the band can't even take it. So everybody leaves except for the lead singer who like takes off his shirt and just starts playing acoustic songs off of their upcoming album, which would yeah. become Brother Sister, <laughs> including songs like I think I think he might have even played in a sweater poorly knit. Or maybe the King Beetle on a Coconut State. It, it, it was just fantastic stuff. <laughs> Amazing memories. By the way, Me Without oh. You may have more biblical references per album yeah. than any band on the face of planet Earth. So, um, they had their last show just recently. Yeah, I know. They have re- retired, I know. in quotes. They'll be missed. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, before we let you go, projects that people need to see from you guys, we'll start with you, Keith Little. Where can we find your stuff? Well, uh, The Cordial Catholic on podcasts and on YouTube. We 
deal with these issues on a weekly basis, right? I have a lot of interviews with non with with people who become Catholic out of various different scenes and different Christian backgrounds or non Christian backgrounds. We have we we tell those stories. We wrestle with those kind of issues that drove people toward Catholicism, so scriptura and the church fathers and authority and these kinds of questions. Uh, we're doing it for three years now, and it's there, it's there's no end in sight. So a huge back catalog of stuff to listen to. Um, that's yeah, podcast and on on YouTube, the Cordial Catholic. All right, Keith Nestor. Well, I've got a website called Down to Earth Ministry dot org, and the down the down to the number two Earth Ministry dot org. <clears throat> um, I've got a weekly podcast called Unpacking the Mass, where I do a little Bible study through each of the readings that are coming up. Um, and that's probably my favorite thing I do. I also pray the Rosary every day with a, on a YouTube channel called Rosary Crew with Keith Nestor. And um, I've got a brand new book coming out September 16th called Unpacking the Mysteries of the Rosary. And I'm very, very excited about that. So you can go to my website on the 16th. It'll be on Amazon. It'll be on my site. I'm fired up about that. And I'm leading a pilgrimage to Mexico City to see the Tilma of Our Lady Guadalupe in January. So we're still taking people for that too. All that stuff you can find on my website, down to earthministry.org. All right. Well, we're throwing out websites. Tons and tons of free resources, including the Journey Home episodes featuring both of these guys at chnetwork.org. You can also plug into our online community where we discuss all kinds of stuff um, related to uh, being on the journey and asking questions about the Catholic faith. Um, that's community.chnetwork.org. And again, our goal is to make all this free to anybody who comes to us looking for help um, as they explore the Catholic faith. And if you want to help us keep that free, then go to uh, to our donate page, which is chnetwork.org slash donate. Gentlemen, thank you. This was cathartic for me. I appreciate you both. <laughs> fun. And we don't uh, do have a great day. Kind of very often. Yeah. 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 Good memories. It's fun. All right. And probably not the last time I will be Stereo Keith's on CH Network <laughs> Presents. We're, we're thank here you all for watching this evening or this morning or this afternoon, whenever you happen to catch it. I'm Matt Swaim. On behalf of all of us here, have a wonderful day.